The Bible stands. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. His pages turn with the truth triumphant and they go with the lies of mine. The Bible stands on the hills, may tumble, it will firmly stand. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on the true triumphant, for the Bible stands. The Bible stands like a mountain, towering far above the works of men. This is my God, ever was refuted and destroyed. Again. The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on truth, triumphant for the Bible stands. The Bible stands, and the truth will triumph in the world that's passed away. By inspiration it has been given all its precepts I will obey. The Bible stands on the hills, may tumble, it will firmly stand. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on the truth, triumphant for the Bible stands. The Bible stands and the truth will triumph for its author is divine. By grace alone I expect to live it and to move it and make it mine. The Bible stands or the hills may tumble and will firmly stand when the earth shall crumble I will plant my feet. On the truth triumphant for the Bible stands. Our um, special music today will be brought to us by Ramiah Cook. Prayer will be done by Ernest and Jeremiah Smith. And of course our speakers are Tom and Elaine Waters.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I would like to invite your individual families to join our collective family all around the world as we come before the throne of grace in prayer. Our gracious Father and King, we thank you so much for the sun shining outside as a promise of the hope of your Son rising in our hearts with healing in his wings, that you would touch each person as we come before you, Lord, offering but ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that you've made it possible for each person to be here so that our hearts can be pricked, our consciousness can be opened, and as people are tuning in worldwide, We just ask, Lord, that you would humble us as your people, that you would soften the grounds of our hearts, that we would be open to your words as you break up the fallow ground. Let us see you and behold you as you are. And Lord, as Tom and Elaine this morning bring another message of brokenness and openness and consecration uh, consecration and holiness, Lord, we ask that you would give us ears to listen, that you would tune our hearts to heaven and that our hearts would be knit with yours in this beautiful tapestry that is and will be eternity. Lord, our families have great need of you. And Lord, as we behold you, we will be changed into your image. So Lord, from the youngest here assembled to the oldest among us, help us to realize our need and that as you pour out the Holy Spirit, through the messages that we hear at this moment and through the rest of this campus, uh, this camp meeting, that, Lord, you would change us. Incremental change, but miraculous and instant change that will last us in this life that we may share with others, that we will gather all your children to the family of heaven and take us home. We thank you in the miraculous name of Jesus. Change us, O Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Are you staying warm in your accommodations? I know somebody the night before last lost their, lost their heat, and it was pretty chilly, so we're staying warm, but we're not camping out either. So we want to welcome not only everyone here, but our live stream audience this morning. We, uh, we think that we have a family joining us from Germany this morning. So if you're out there joining us, we're happy to have you as well as all the live stream, but we got an email that they might be joining us this morning. So, you really believe truth will triumph? You want to triumph with the truth? Yes. Yes, and if we're going to do that, this morning we're going to be talking about following the leader. And if we want to triumph with the truth, we have to follow the way and the truth and the life. And He will lead us all the way home. So we're going to be talking this morning about parenting in the context of following the leader. And we need about 12 to 15 willing volunteers that would be ages 4 to 12 or 13. Now, we know we have lots of that age category out here, but we need some volunteers. Put your hands up. 12 or 15 volunteers that are ages 4 to, look at this. Okay, all the way in the back there with the blue sleeve. I see a blue sleeve. Yeah, that's you. Come on up. This is what we love about the, you know, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. If we were doing this with adults, okay, that's, okay, that's enough. Thank you. Uh, If we were... We were doing this with adults. Okay, we we would not have adults just spontaneously walking up here. Okay, twelve to (laughs) twelve to fifteen. So parents start counting how many are up here, and and let's see. I hope we have too many. I think we're tall ones in the back and shorter ones in the front. Come on over here, all all of you on this side. Yeah, come right over here. You You can be in the front row, okay? Can you step right up here? We're going to play follow the leader. We'd ever- still be waiting for the adults to raise their hands, okay? Can, <laughs> okay? Can you and they're all up here ready to go. 
Sweetheart, can you stand right here? Me? No, you step back a little bit. And these two boys right here that look so nicely match. We're going to put you right there. Okay, young people. Bethany, can you stand there? How many of you have ever played Follow the Leader? All right. That's what we're going to do today, okay? I'm going to be the one doing the talking, but... And I'm going to be your leader. She's going to be the leader. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, so who's your leader? Okay, good. All right. So we're playing follow the leader, aren't we? So, am I the leader or is she the leader? She's the leader. Okay, good. Just making sure. Everybody's following the leader, right? Okay. How are we doing? Okay. Good. Good. We're having a good time, aren't now we? Now your parents know what you can play for family time, right? Okay. All right. So that was our first activity. Was that fun? <laughs> okay. It's going to get more fun, okay? All right. This time. Here's what we need to do. Who's your leader? All right, but I'm going to talk to you and tell you what to do. I want everybody to raise your right hand. Okay? Follow the leader. Who's the leader? I'm the leader, and I want you to raise your right hand. Your right hand, children. Okay. Oh, we got a little bit of confusion going on here, but uh, follow the leader. Yeah, when in doubt, raise both hands, okay? <laughs> okay, good, good. That's, that's what I call logical thinking here. <laughs> Process it. You can't okay. get wrong if you do both, okay? All right, that was, that was okay. good, okay? Is it getting more fun? Okay, All right, the last one's really going to be fun. All right. Here's what we want you to do on the last one. Remember, that's your leader right there, Okay? What your leader wants you to do is to use your index fingers. How many of you know what the index finger? That's this finger. You got two okay. of them. Two of them. Use your index finger. I've got a microphone, so it's hard to do that. But put your index finger in your ears and plug your ears. Okay? Follow the leader. Oh, wow. Now we're really having fun. Okay? Very good. Okay, you can put your hands down. Was that hard? No. Didn't make you do anything that was embarrassing? And you all did pretty well, okay? Especially on that last one. All right, now we have something for you. So who is the real leader? <clears throat> for, I am for this activity, right? But who's the leader for the whole world? Jesus. That's right. And so who are we going to follow? And how do we know how to follow Jesus? The Reading the Bible and praying. So we brought a special, go ahead, honey, a special, special Bible, little Bible for each of you. You can take one. Just and take it has one. a verse from it's every the whole Bible. book of but the But it's Bible. only one verse from the Bible, okay? It's one verse from each chapter of the Bible, okay? Not the, not the whole Bible, not every verse of the whole Bible. There should be one for everyone. Okay. Did you he's, hear? He's, here, got, he's, got, he's got three. Okay, so one, one, these, one for each one. Well, no, honey, we can't. Daddy wasn't up here. So. Sorry, Daddy wasn't up here, so he doesn't get one, okay? You. you can share yours with Daddy, though, but thank you for wanting to share. We only had enough for the, the young people up here. So do you want to stay with us or go down with Mom and Dad? Okay, thank you for your help. Okay. So children, those of you who got the Bible, and all those of you who didn't get one of these little Bibles that are really, to me, a treasure. I love little things, and these little Bibles are so much fun. I've been trying to memorize it. They have a scripture from every book of the Bible. Certain books, like Psalms and other, have several verses. But I have been so... Um, inspired by whoever captured the content of each book of the Bible and picked one or two verses to represent the message of the book. It is really amazing. And I've been trying to memorize it. It also has pictures in it. So children, I want you to try to memorize that. You will do better than I will do, I'm sure. So I just had something spontaneous happen. Okay. Is it going to embarrass me? 
Does it need to? Okay. Do you want to do you want to share any of your memory from the Bible? <laughs> no, because I will be blank because my mind is here. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. I will with you privately. How's that? All right. Good. So you children that were up here, thank you first of all for being up here, and we know that you can probably memorize this Bible today. Okay, because you have great memories, okay? <laughs> or the next week. Anyway, it's been, it's been an inspiration to me. It's a little, you can stick it in your pocket, you know, in your purse. It's not heavy. And I don't know, there's something about just seeing it in black and white and being able to turn the page that I like. Plus, I actually enjoy the pictures as well. <laughs> I still like the little pictures in the Bible. All right, so we were talking about following the leader, and this was a simple illustration with the young people. Did you notice... The first activity, we'll call it the silent activity. Did you see that some of the young people didn't do anything? Some of them, you know, tried to follow what they thought might be happening. But this illustrates one kind of parenting that is very prominent by default. That is that our young people are just supposed to know what to do and they're just supposed to figure it out, and they just follow what we do. Although some of the time. Some of the time. <laughs> but it's very confusing because we're really not giving them clear instructions. We're just somehow thinking that maybe by osmosis or diffusion, they will just figure out how to be Christians and good following the leader kind of children. It doesn't work very well. Or... We can say, if we only take them to church one day a week and give them two to maybe three hours at most of any type of a spiritual context, then we assume and expect them to learn to be like Christ. We're missing it, friends. It's, it's an intentional part that we have to, as parents to play, to teach and train our children to be Christ-like to let the Lord be in their heart. So that first example, we're going to look at three parenting styles, all of which were illustrated by your children here this morning. And I think you got the picture, right? Those of you who could sit back and look on. The second thing was we asked the children, all of them, to raise their right hand. And what did I do? I raised my left hand. Now, there was a reason. If I would have faced the children like this and asked them to raise their right hand, we probably would have had 100%, right? But I'm going in the same direction. I want them to go in, but I raised the opposite hand of what I asked them to do and what he asked them to do. And did you notice the confusion that took place? First of all, quite a few put their right hands up. Some just looked at what I was doing, put their left hand up. And there were a few who were really processing this, saying, I'm playing it safe. She said right hand, I'm doing it. She's doing left hand, I'm doing it. That way, I've got it. Okay? So that was quite interesting process. You notice that happened in the older ones, more in the middle and back row. I don't think, I didn't see it happening so much in the front row. But anyway, that parenting style is we tell our children something to do, we give them instruction, we give them principles, but we live something different by our example. And it brings total confusion. Because we give, we may give right instruction, we may give right principles, but if we ourselves don't follow our own instruction to our children, if we don't model that, our children will more than likely follow our example more than our, our direction, our verbal direction. And a classic example, and it has happened in our home as well, and it some, goes something like this. Children, we have told you to stop arguing and fighting with each other. Now, if you keep arguing with each other and picking at each other, we're going to have to da 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 So we give these verbal reprimands, we give these verbal commands, and then what happens, mom and dad? Come on, let's be real, let's be honest. You're not being recorded, they can't hear your voices, they don't see your We're the only ones that are getting recorded, so. (laughs) Then mom and dad are, you know, a few hours later, the next day, what are we doing? Arguing and bickering, right? And we, we... correct our children for and then we do it ourselves and and what is our correction 
we don't correct ourselves. We excuse ourselves because we're adults and we have to work this out, you know. Uh Uh-uh. That's the wrong message. So we want to give the third parenting style. And by the way, we did tell our children that, as Scott mentioned yesterday in his message, that they could respectfully come to us if they saw us modeling, (laughs) unintentionally modeling, (laughs) behavior that was not compatible with what we were preaching, okay? And I tell you, is that the time you really love to hear from your children? It's like, oh, wow, thank you. That was really good. That makes me feel really good. That's the least time you want to hear from your children. And I can remember our oldest daughter coming to me and saying rather timidly and respectfully, Father, do you know how quiet it got? (laughs) Yeah, that's... That's not a man-made silence. (laughs) Father, is that the way that you want to be talking to mother? What am I going to say then? Yes, that's the way I want to be talking (laughs) to mother. I mean, how do you... (laughs) There's an instant call. Now, has the Holy Spirit already been calling to my heart? In this situation? Absolutely. Absolutely. God is no respecter of persons. But now when my daughter in human flesh meekly says to me, Father, that has an added emphasis to me. And by God's grace, it also got the right response. So it is better to actually model what we say. And if we don't, it's really good to be able to say to Whoever's involved, you know, whether it's mom or the children or everybody's in the same room, it's nice to be able to say, I'm sorry for the way that I spoke to your mother. Please forgive me. Because it affects everybody in the room, right? So that's modeling. And it's been great to see our children as they've grown up that they, rather than making the excuses, they will, they will do that. They will say, I'm sorry to the person that they've offended or spoken wrong to, but they will also say, I'm sorry for the influence that it had on you as my sisters or my brother and sister. So the third third emphasis, and this is what we're going to focus on the rest of this presentation this morning, is that we not only say what we mean and mean what we say, but we also live it. We, We exemplify it in our lives. And there's a passage found in Psalm 25 in verses 4 and 5. It says, show me... Thy ways, O Lord, show me. Teach me thy paths and lead me. Show, teach, and lead. Lead me in the truth. Thy truth. Teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day long. Waiting for what? (laughs) Waiting for practical instruction. Waiting for him to show the way. Waiting for him to teach us in the way that we should go. That's the way God wants us to deal with our children. So for us as parents, a long time ago when we were having um, quite a few problems in our home, not that we still don't have some problems every now and then, but this was the early days of parenting, It was very frustrating, very discouraging, sometimes overwhelming, sometimes felt like escaping, all the above, and maybe other kind of emotions that in response to things not going very well in the home. And I read a lot of books, but I found a lot of disappointment because I tried to implement and then that didn't work, and then I I was feeling a bit desperate, and one day I know the the Lord really spoke to my heart, and he really called to me that I'm not really spending time in the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. I'm not really spending time in the inspired commentaries on the Holy Scriptures. I've been reading more man's ideas that they have extrapolated from Scripture and tried to funnel it down, and then they put their own bent to it. 
And so one of the things we began to do is not only both of us as parents began to take our personal study time in the morning, focusing on parenting, because we were living as parents every day and we were stumbling every day as parents to put our focus there. But whenever something we read would speak to our heart or step on our toes or pierce our heart at that point, particularly I would because I was much more involved all through the day with the children than was my husband. I would write that out on a piece of paper, and I would stick it at my desk. Uh, Sometimes I would put it on the kitchen cupboard next to the sink. So when the children were really little, it was more obviously in the kitchen because I spent a little more time in there. As the children were in the school, and we homeschooled our children, I put it at my desk. And I kept referring back to that, referring back to that. Because first of all, we forget. We can be encouraged and inspired at the beginning of the day and three hours into the day or 30 minutes into the day. We can lose our inspiration, lose our direction, and go to our default mode. And so by having this constantly in front of me, it was a reminder of what God was wanting from me as a parent. And I found that extremely helpful. So through the years, my ongoing study was parenting. And through the years, I've had numerous different things put in front of me at my desk. And this is one of the things that really impacted me. It's just two sentences, one short little paragraph from the book Fundamentals of Education, page 65. But I tell you, we need to not read quantity, but we need to read a little bit and digest it. And this morning, we're going to read this simple quote, and we're going to help all of us digest it here this morning, because it is really the foundation of our role as parents. So in this small paragraph... There are nine things that we are instructed to do. Nine things. So I just want you to get heads up and listen as I read this. See if you can pick out the nine things in these two short sentences. Parents, by precept and example, so there's our illustration, precept and example, should teach their children the love and the fear of God. Teach them to be intelligent. Teach them to be social. Teach them to be affectionate. To cultivate habits of industry, economy, and self-denial. By giving their children love, sympathy, and encouragement at home, parents may provide for them a safe, And welcome in retreat from many of the world's temptations. There's the nine things. Now the context of this, these nine things is to love and to fear who? God. God. And these are nine things that we are to teach, to cultivate, and to give to our children day by day, to help them cultivate into their experience the love and the fear of God. So, there's a lot in those two sentences, right? This particular reference was at my desk a long time, and sometimes I'd add things to it, but particularly because there's three areas that God is calling us to work in, and each of those three areas, there are three things we are to do in those areas. The first area was what we're going to teach, Second area is what we're going to cultivate. That's teaching is more the mind, and, and that cultivating is more the hands-on work, uh, taking the information from the brain and helping it become a reality in the experience. And then we also need to give our children something. So each of those three areas had three things listed under them that is um, going to take all of us as parents some diligent prayer, uh, determination, effort, and surrender on our part to do daily with our children. 
But when we begin to implement, and we're using this as an example to encourage you to take one simple statement, one simple principle from the Word of God, practicalize it, and let it be the theme in your, your life, in your home for however long until you begin to have it become feel more comfortable, more spontaneous. So we want to encourage you to do that. So we're going to dissect this and want to digest it here this morning. So the first area is that we are to teach, okay? To teach them to be intelligent. One of the first and most basic lessons that we can teach our children is the cause and effect relationship in every transaction of life. If you do this, this will happen, okay? These are some of these laws of nature, like gravity. So our son, Josiah, our youngest, when we moved out to Montana, which was a big change in our lives from our professional medical careers, when we moved out there, he was three months old. And as he was growing up, uh, he had one of these things, and at the time we called it a binky. How many know what a binky is? Okay, all right. <laughs> anyway, he loved to suck on this thing, okay? And I'm not good with what age was he when we were driving home from... Probably Whitefish. around 14 months. All right, so he's in the back seat. We had at the time a Ford F-150 Super Cab. Means it had a kind of a back seat. An smaller. old one. It was an old one. It was a very old one. And he's sitting back there, so I'm driving, he's sitting back there in his car seat, and he has this binky, and it's, it's a beautiful day, and his little side wing window was open, and I hear him making some noise back there, and he has his binky out, and he's holding on to it by the little, whatever those hook. things, the hook, the handle, whatever, and he's holding on to that, and he's kind of hitting it on the window, and I said to him, if you drop that, it's all gone. Now, whenever you say something like that to a, you know, a child that age, I don't know, it just plants a seed in their mind like, oh, I think I'm going to figure on dropping this thing. <laughs> so he puts it over the window, and he just hangs it there, and he looks over at me, and I look over at him, and I said it one more time. Because sometimes we think at 14 months old, they don't understand. I tell you, they understand so much that many of them at that age are already running the home. Okay? You know what I mean. They are running the home. They have figured mom and dad out. They know how to play us. And so he understood. But I said, if you drop that, it is all gone. It, it, it will never be again. <laughs> now that's, scary. that's scarier for parents than it is for him. Okay? But he doesn't know that. So he puts it over the window again, the second time, and he looks at me, and I could see the look in his eyes. Is that terrible? I could actually see the look in his eyes, and he just dropped it. Like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and Daddy kept driving. Daddy said, you'll see what I'm going to do about it. <laughs> and we just drive. We don't stop. And, and he's trying to look out the window to see it, He's right? trying to see he, if he can he, still see this. He can thing. hardly see past the wing of the car seat. You know, he's trying to, it's all strapped in, looking like that, you know. And then he, he soon realizes that we're, we're not slowing down. We're not. <laughs> and then he starts to react. This is a cause and effect <laughs> transaction <laughs> in real life. And we just, I said to him, it's all gone. And it began to dawn upon his young mind <laughs> what that means. Is that a good lesson? Is that teaching intelligence? Yes. It was a great lesson. But let me tell you what happened that night. Well, my wife can tell you. <laughs> well, we're, it wasn't even but 30, 40 minutes later. I don't know. We made one, one or two stops, and we're on our way through the town and on the 50-mile stretch to go home. And our truck breaks down. I mean, just totally. It was, it was history. Now, 
a mechanic could revive it, but there's nothing we could do. We're on the side of the road. We're stranded. And I think somebody, or maybe you, I don't know, what, if, did we ever get it back to the hotel? Anyway, long story short, we ended up staying the night in the closest hotel to where we broke down, which happened to be a resort hotel, which happened to have resort prices. But they had mercy on us because we didn't have resort pocketbooks. <laughs> And so they, they, they gave us kind of a desperation special that night. You know, here we, we walk in, we're haggard, and I've got a, you know, 14-month-old who's crying because his binky is, you know, 15 miles away. And, um, and, a, and, a, and a dad who's saying, you got any extra binkies? Or <laughs> 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 that was, honestly, it was a temptation, and she did actually have an extra one, but we resisted the temptation to get it out. Okay. So anyway, Praise the Lord. We, we got a room, and it was a very nice room, actually. It was very spacious, and we have three children. Let's see, Alice would have been about six and a half. She wasn't quite seven yet. Seven and under, and we're in this hotel room, and, you know, I tried not to let him just suck it all day long, so it was like for naps, and the reason he had it in the car is because I thought he was going to take a nap as we were heading home, but he didn't, and he played this game with Dad, and obviously the binky's gone. I did have the diaper bag, and every, every prepared mother always has a spare, right? <laughs> and I had a spare, but he didn't know that. I told him, but so we're going through the night. Now it's bedtime, and now the tears. Oh, and, I, if it would have just been tears, it would have been fine. <laughs> tears and, and, and a vocal, uh, very loud vocal responses. I'm thinking they're going to evict us from the hotel is what I'm thinking. <laughs> and I'm sure that whoever was below us, beside us, and above us was wondering what kind of people are staying in this hotel because it did go on for a while. And I tell you, everything inside of me wanted to default to my mom's mode of let's just get this baby quiet. But we had said, not just dad, but I had said, if you, because we were trying, we were already processing this, because our first child loved the binky too, and boy, was it hard to get it away from her, and we finally got it done by three years old, and we thought, boy, is she going to go through life sucking this thing, or what? <laughs> our second child didn't want a binky, and that, well, we were so relieved, but then she went to her fingers, you can't get rid of those. <laughs> So then that was traumatic, and we tried different things to keep those out of the mouth uh, by, you know, the age of two. And then now we're on our third child. See, we've been through it like you guys, and we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. So we were already thinking, 14 months, we got to start earlier with this one to get this. So he had it solved. I mean, Josiah decided he's going to let it go. Anyway, we made it through the night. He finally settled down. And from that night forward, he never asked for another binky. Never. Now, it was hard on us. It was hard on all of our neighbors around us. It was traumatic for our child. But he learned. He, he was learning cause to effect. If you do, this is the result. And he learned a very good lesson Amen. in intelligence that night. I wanted to kind of put a sign on the door, parents in training. <laughs> it's not children, it's parents in training. <laughs> anyway, we get through these things, but we get through them a lot easier if we say what we mean and mean what we say. And that took us a while to figure that out. And follow through with and it. And follow through with yeah. it. That's right. Exactly. Because too many times uh, we've been in situations where you hear a mother, I, I cringe. Done we've done it, but I, I cringe because we're, we're literally walking into this house. We're complete strangers to the family. You know, we're doing meetings and we're invited over to sit down and talk with these parents. We hadn't even sat down on the couch, and one of the children, about three or four years old, grabs a pillow off the couch. It's real life. Comes at me with the pillow, <laughs> and is ready to hit me with the pillow. And the mother said, and this is where I cringe, because it doesn't bother me to get hit with a pillow. But the mother, I knew what she was going to say. What's she going to say? Don't do that. And I knew, what's the child going to do? Do it anyway. So I cringed because here we are. We haven't even sat down on the couch, and we're going to be into the real life of mother says don't, child does it anyway. What are we going to do? Nothing. Nothing. And anyway, that, that was another story. But 
we can make it a lot easier on ourselves and on our children with this cause and effect intelligence, teaching them intelligence that when we say something, we mean it. And the second area we're supposed to teach is teaching our children to be social. Now, children are naturally social, aren't they? I mean, when we get them home from the hospital and we, we wait for those moments when they have real recognition. They, they recognize mommy's face. They recognize daddy's face. They recognize their sibling's face. And they smile. That's social. That's the social part of the child. Maturing, right? Happens just in the first few months of time. And yet we're told in inspiration that we need to teach our children to be social. So really, what God is telling us as parents is children need to learn how to be social and socialize and be comfortable with anybody and everybody. Regardless of size, age, color, looks, or anything. And children, really, God has given them the advantage because they don't have a lot of the barriers that we sometimes mature into some of our, you know, we have certain ways we look at people or whatever. They don't really have those, but we're told to teach our children to be social. And we began to recognize that our children needed to learn how to get along as brothers and sisters first. If they could get along and love each other and play happily together at home and they were best friends, then they could have other friends, be social with other friends. If they learned how to get along with mommy and daddy and we could play together and have fun and have good communication, we're teaching our children to be social. What happens so often is that once our children are old enough to do some things like to entertain themselves, we let them entertain themselves. We keep ourselves preoccupied. Our interactions with them is, you know, to try to stop a fight or to try to stop them from doing something we don't want them to do. And then we allow arguing and disputing and bickering amongst them. And they go to church and then they want to be with their friends. And they always want to have their friends over. So we took the emphasis and put it at the best friends we have are the ones right here in the family because God's the one who ordained it. And he said, these two parents and these children, they're going to be best friends right here in the family unit. And so when we teach our children how to love and, and be happy and share and be kind and enjoy each other's company, then we are preparing them to have more social interactions because they're learning how to socialize with people of different ages. And they, when their friends come over, they don't exclude their sister or their brother. They can all play together and have fun. So teaching our children to be social, the best place is in our families. And then the third area, that we're to teach them to be intelligent, teach them to be social, and teach them to be affectionate. Well, many of you, because this is a family retreat, and many of you have been experiencing happy families. But you would be, and maybe you wouldn't be shocked, but I think you might be shocked to know how many people that we talk with privately behind the scenes who the parents don't know how to be affectionate. As hard as it may be to believe, there are people who just talked to someone recently had never ever experienced a hug from either father or mother, ever. Does that seem unbelievable? But it's true. But there may be a few of you out there who know exactly what this is like. And you don't know what to do when, you know, you just go stiff. If a moment happens when somebody that you meet or a relative wants to hug you. We need to not take this for granted. If you've got a great, you know, normal affection in the family, that's wonderful. But one of the greatest blessings that our children have expressed to us, who are now all 30 and above, is the example of affection between mom and dad. Normal, appropriate affection in the family. And that being expressed to them as our young people, okay? That cannot happen without intentional desire and choice for that to happen within the family. 
and teaching them that affection means kindness, speaking kindly, doing kind deeds and acts, showing compassion for somebody. You know, if, if Josiah's Lego tower falls over, affection is his sister who's playing with him saying, oh, Josiah, I'm sorry, I'll help you rebuild it. So just that kind of interaction teaches our children the affection that they need, proper affection we're speaking of, and you know intuitively, adults, what we're talking about. Proper affection is necessary. We have to model it in our homes. Um, holding hands, having, putting our arms around each other. Not just in a meeting, not just if we're going to go on vacation or mom and dad have a weekend away together without the children. It's talking about when we're sitting in worship. We can sit as a husband and wife and hold hands, or we can hold one of our children's hands, or when we're reading with them, put our arm around them and read together at worship time. Those are simple ways, and that should be happening spontaneously in different ways through the day. Now the, the, inspiration, the inspired commentary says we are to cultivate habits. Three habits were to cultivate. And the first one mentioned is the habit of industry. That means how to know what to do so you don't just sit idle. So that you don't have to be told everything. So that you know how to be self-directed and industrious. Teach our children how to be, how to be industrious. And so... One of the things we recognized, because we were doing it wrong, we would have, say to our children things like this, you know, I would like you to make your bed, and I'd like you to do this and do that, and then kind of mom sounds like a broken record, I'd like you to do this, and every day we said, I'd like you to do this. And then I remember the day I walked into the girls' bedroom, they were probably six and four, something like that, seven and five, and I had been saying this every day for weeks. And I walked into their bedroom one morning, and they're sitting on the bed. Both of them sitting on their beds. The beds weren't made. They weren't dressed. And I said, why aren't you dressed? Why aren't your bed made? Well, Mommy, you never told us to. Oh. Well, you know, I've been telling you, like, you know, I've been telling you that for the last four weeks. How come you're, well, because you didn't tell us today, Mommy. And my husband, I, I went into our room, a very exasperated frustrated. I'm, I guess I can't believe this. He says, honey, they're just doing what you ta taught them. You've, you've conditioned them to wait to te until you tell them everything to do. So that was the turning point in our home. That very day, we had our first family council. And it was called self-government. Yes, I had to explain the terms. But from that day, I'm not going to say we had a miracle change, but from that day, we had a definite change that now they, we, we developed a chart that day. It was an activity, a work chart, a responsibility chart, because they're little, and they love to put stickers on charts. How many parents have ever done the sticker charts? Okay. Anyway, that day... Before the close of the, of the day, <laughs> there was a new expectation for self-government, self-motivation. So we said to them, tomorrow morning, no one is going to tell you to make your bed, okay? No one is going to tell you to drink your water. No one is going to tell you to put your clothes on, okay? Now, there's a lot more to this because you can't expect them to always get the outfits right. But that began to change in our home, and it was a great change. And we took on the, the idea in our home that if we're going to have industry that works, they need to be a part of everything that really happens in the home that's along the lines of work. Know how to clean the dishes. They need to know how to clean the toilets. They need to know how to vacuum the floors, sweep the floors, age appropriate. But I'm telling you, when I say age appropriate, I'm not talking about 10 and 12 years old. You wait till 10 and 12 years old and you've missed age appropriate. Because at two and three and four years old, they love to help. And you know, later years, they aren't so sure they wanna help. They would rather do what they wanna do and the trends today, are not always easy to get them off the couch to do it. 
So cultivate the habit of industry, and then next word here, cultivate the habit. A habit is something you do repetitively, right? If you have a habit, it means you do it over and over and over and over and over again. It's part of who you are. And so the habit of economy is the next thing. And we didn't give our children any allowances. We didn't give them money just because they were our children or just because it was a new day starting a new week. We Or for doing ordinary things that everybody does in a regular yeah. home. For doing, yeah, exactly. So we were trying to figure this one out, economy. How do we teach them to be econ economical? And sometimes when we go to town, you know, children, they've got big eyes, and they see things sometimes they haven't seen before. Because if you don't have a TV, there's a lot of things they've never seen that the stores are full of, right? And they would see something, that, oh, wow, Mommy, can we get this? Or, wow, I would really like to have one of those. Or some of their friends would get something. Oh, I'd like one of those, Mommy. And they just think that because they want, they should get. But that's not teaching economy. So we decided, and they were a little older at this time, the girls were in school. I think Josiah was right around first or second grade. We decided, okay, every year we give our children, we, we spend, we don't give it to them, we spent about $100 a year for basic personal needs, like maybe new shoes, socks, underwear, shirt, something, outside of a birthday or Christmas where they might get some of those things spontaneously. So we came up with the idea, they're old enough to learn how to manage money. They, they're learning math, so they should learn how to manage money, make math practical. And so we told our children at the beginning of the year, we are going to give you each $100. Well, ho, that was exciting, $100. Now, Especially for Josiah. Yes. <laughs> Now, that may not seem like a lot, and it may seem like a lot to some of the young children, but this was the condition. They were, to make, they were going to manage that $100, and they were going to be responsible. If they wanted a new pair of shoes, it would come out of the $100. If they wanted a new shirt or a new pair of jeans or a new blouse or whatever, it would come out of their money. And at the end of the year, whatever money remained that had not been spent, that was theirs free. Okay, so the $100 wasn't managed to go out, oh, I want this toy and I want that toy. Uh -uh. It was for basic needs, the same way we had been spending it. And we were going to let them manage it. So we talked to them about it. They also had to keep a ledger. They had to keep an account of it. And any time they spent the 100 or part of that 100 they had to come home and they had to enter it into the book. They had to do the math and get the subtraction, see what they had remaining. That took away all of, Mommy, would you get these for me? I remember going to the store, and our son, he loved hats and shoes. Now, that would seem at least shoes would be a girl's thing, but he loved shoes, especially cowboy boots. We lived in Montana, so he saw a lot of people wearing boots. And he, he just had this love for boots, and he saw this pair in Fred Meyer. That was a store that had everything in it, one-stop shop. Mother, I really want to get those boots. I said, that's fine. How much money do you have left? And he thought about it, and he's thinking, oh, how much are they? And then he thought, well, I, I know I have that much, but I don't know how much I'll have left, because he wasn't really sharp at that point with mental math. And then he said, no, I, no, I don't want them. And he says, Mother, before we go home today, can we go by the thrift store? And I said, sure. So we went to a thrift store, went through the store. He went to the shoe department. He found a pair of cowboy boots, well-worn. They were $3. <laughs> they were a little big, but that was okay. Because it didn't, it didn't matter if they were too big. I mean, he would wear shoes a couple sizes bigger than he needed, but especially boots. But he was so excited. And we saw at that point, he's catching the vision, right? $30 or $3, okay? The money doesn't just come out of the pocket of parents. <laughs> <laughs> so cultivate the habit of economy. It has been a blessing in our young people's lives, and uh, it'll be a blessing in our lives as parents. Because remember, the whole emphasis is we have to do it by precept and example. We have to teach and cultivate and train. That means mom and dad, we were keeping a budget as well, and we were only spending what was in the budget, not because we had a whim for something. And then the third area that we need to cultivate is self-denial. Don't we just love that, that concept? <laughs> just li listen to all the amens. <laughs> self-denial. <laughs> self wants what self wants now. Right? But that's not good. <laughs> And the example that we'll share with you, which is a very simple example, but it's real and 
I had to be involved in it as well. We had this, a couple of us, Josiah and I, had this bad habit that when the blessing was said at the food, we had a tendency to dive in. You understand that term? Not literally. But we were right there getting the food. We liked to eat, okay? Is there anything wrong with enjoying eating? Okay, but you could kind of count on the two of us being, and sometimes, and I'm not proud of this, but it's just an illustration of reality. Sometimes we would have our food and be eating and, and <clears throat> sometimes be half done eating. <laughs> That's a little bit of an exaggeration. Before everybody else actually had their food <laughs> on their plates. Now, does that sound like self-denial? No. Okay? See, I could have used a lot of examples here, but I used one that, you know, we need to model the difference. We need to be involved. It's not just getting our children to change. It's we are changing. God is changing us. And so we made, we made a commitment at the table suggested by me because I recognize this, this need. We're, we're, we're reading these things. And so I suggested that when the blessing is said, that we all wait until everyone is served before anyone takes the first bite. Now, who was I talking to? Two of us in particular, okay? <laughs> But everybody agreed that that would be a blessing and that would be a self-denial. And it's a simple example, but it worked. And it worked marvelously. It was good for us. Again, there are many ways we can do this, but we need to move along. We want to go to the third area, and these are what we are to give our children. We've done the teaching. We've done the cultivating the habits. Now this is what we're to give. And the first thing that we're told we need to give our children is love. We have normal love. We have parental love. We have the, the emotional love for our children, don't we? Most of the time. <laughs> but they also, there are also times in our lives where we still love them, but it doesn't show that we love them. Of how we act and how we speak and how our face looks and how we fume and other ways. So really to give our children love means more than just affection. It means that we need to give them our time, our energy, our enthusiasm, our commitments. We need to be there for them. We need to have the time to listen to them, to enter in with them, to understand their heart, to dream big with them, to feel their pains and their disappointments and their sorrows. All of that is love, and we're going to call it unconditional love. So often children are taught that when they're good, they're loved, and when they're bad, they're bad. And mom and dad's countenances and mom and dad's words communicate a message that's far from love to them. It means, you know, right now you're bad and just, you know, whatever. But we are to love at all times. And God is the, Christ is the example. God is our example in this. When things are difficult, he still loves us. He says, why you are yet sinners? He says, you're still in the process. I love you. And our children need that message, friends. Our children know, need to know that no matter what choices they make, how bad they are, who their friends are, or what they've done, that nothing can ever stop us from loving them. Nothing. And, and God, will, God has put us through that test in a, in a huge way in our life in parenting. And I tell you, it has been a tremendous blessing for us because we understand much clearer how infinite the love of God really is. And that really touches our hearts. For me, one of the greatest blessings to translate in love was time. I used to be one of these men who always had you know, a project, always things going on, and would see myself when our children were little, see myself saying, not right now, daddy's busy, daddy doesn't have time, da daddy will do something later. And I just praise God that he opened my eyes. I mean, you talk about scales falling off the eyes to recognize when I was always busy. 
And I thank God that he helped me to see that those children are going to grow up so fast. And they do. But I can tell you today that that is not one of my regrets. And I've sat with many men my age and younger who have that deep regret because their children have grown up before their eyes and they have missed the opportunity of expressing love through time and connection with the hearts of our children. Don't miss that opportunity to manifest love. Sympathy. We're to give our children sympathy, and that really is tied into love, honestly entering in with them when things are difficult. Um, our children go through difficult times, disappointments. Um, I remember particular older two girls. We had planned to do a mission trip as a family. We had it all set up. We were going to go to orphanage in Central America. We were going to spend a week or two of time there and just kind of expose our children to something different than what they were accustomed to and give them a, a different passion for people and they they were so excited especially the girls being older they were really into this they had done a lot of the communication with the orphanage and then my husband's mother was diagnosed with cancer and she was failing very quickly and we had to give up that mission trip in order to go to Florida to get grandma and take care of grandma and bring her drive her back to Montana and I, I tell you, I know the girls were disappointed because this had been something we'd been planning for a long time and something they were really looking forward to. But as we heard their hearts, they, they gave it up willingly because they knew that time with their grandmother was more important than their own personal desires and wishes. But just having the time to enter in with them in that disappointment, understanding their hearts, we need to show our children sympathy. And, and that sympathy... And that's a beautiful example, and it was very meaningful. But that sympathy needs to happen where they are today in your home. Right. Not when somebody's, just, somebody's dying. But your young person may be dying for the need of being understood. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities them. This is what we need in our hearts to enter in. When our young people understand that we really, I've been able to say to every one of our children, I've been where you've been. You haven't been where I've been yet. But I've been where you've been, and I can enter into those feelings. I can enter into why you're having these struggles in your heart right now. That entering in can be done daily, not just under a difficult, traumatic experience. And lastly, we need to give encouragement to our children. Our default mechanism is they haven't arrived. They haven't, <laughs> they haven't got it yet. And, and yeah, they're working on it, but we, we've got to keep, keep them moving forward. Yes, we need to keep them moving forward, but we need to be encouraging every right decision that they make. That one element in our family made such a huge difference noticing intentionally, prayerfully in the morning, having the Holy, asking the Holy Spirit to bring to our attention when they're responding to their call from God, when they're doing every right decision. We, not that we did every time, but we really started encouraging the things that we saw. And you know it had a direct proportional influence on the, the things that we were trying to root out. The more we encourage them, the more spontaneous growth we saw happening in the children compared to just being on them, on them, on them. You're not getting it. Come on, you can do better than that. The change in that one thing to encourage our children can drive such a difference in the family. Isaiah, in closing, Isaiah 28.10 says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Did I just repeat myself four times? <laughs> no, that was inspired. Four times. I don't know how many of you in your studies recognize that when something is repeated, the more it's repeated, the more significance it means that it needs to be applied. Then it says, line upon line. Line upon line, here a little and there a little. This is what God is calling us to do, to be 
the parents that can lead our children and to help them recognize that truth can triumph in our families. Amen. Okay? It isn't how much we read. I used to be a volume reader, okay? Because I, I like to read. And I used to read volumes of stuff, and I really felt pretty good about it until I began to realize that I was not doing much practically in changing my life, okay? And so we started focusing on taking something like we've shared with you this morning and just going deep into it and saying, okay, so how do these nine things look in our reality? Well, they weren't looking very good when we posted that up on the, the desk there on the wall. But they began to change because we focused on making it a practical reality. So line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, bring it into the family and watch the difference it can make to not just expect them to do it by some example that's sporadic or say one thing and do something different and expect them to get it right. You know, raise, raise your right hand when I'm raising my left. Is, that's confusing. But God is asking us to, to really think about where we want to go with our families and talk about it, teach it, to instill it, to cultivate it, and then to give to them. So this just one paragraph, was that packed with stuff? We could have talked for an hour and a half about these things. But if we will take these and bring them practically into our experience, it'll make a difference. In closing, we just want to share with you a letter we received uh, several months ago. Actually, it's been a year already. From a friend of ours, um, we've known this family for many years. They have older children who are the ages of our oldest two children. And um, we've got to be very close with them. Anyway, their third-born child was born with Down syndrome. And they, they were given the option to, you know, take another path in birthing the child, okay? But they chose to let God has given them this child with these needs for a reason. And it's a gift. But one thing that they, they told us at the very beginning of this experience that they had, yeah, there was a lot of emotion in it. There was a lot of, yeah, human disappointment maybe. But they said, what is clear to us is that God is asking us to raise this child no differently than our other two. The same principles of his word, the same expectation we have on the older ones, we're going to cultivate that and have those expectations to the, to the max possibility in this child. They turned aside from the medical and the cultural views of a Down syndrome child, and they poured their heart, their energy, their effort, not just as parents, but as an entire family, to help this child achieve his highest potential. And this letter comes, came to us from the mother of Seth, and they've given us permission to share his name and their experience. And this is a child who had many disadvantages and many strikes against him, but through the parents, particularly what their commitment was to him in applying the principles that we've shared here today and many others that you will find as you study how to be a better parent. And, the, and Seth now, he has completed his high school, level. He went away to a special academy that had the academics, so he had to do the same academics any high school student has to do. And he completed that successfully. He also in, has completed, or was, pro, I'm going to read this paragraph. They are excited about how well Seth was doing at Mission Creek Academy. He's finishing a small engine certification with a 97% average. Small engine repair is the same one that anybody in this room can go out and take in your local community. And he has a 97% average. He's getting ready for moving from his driver's permit to having his own driver's license. And the most important area of growth in Seth's life is his character development. We are so happy to see his strong commitment to serve others and to be the man of God that God has called him to be. He loves missions, he loves people, he loves helping. And he's finished that degree, he has a job now, and he works under, under someone, 
and he is living an independent life, still with some, you know, supervision, but independently. And it has been amazing to see his growth. He attended the Northwest Family Retreat last summer. He was up every morning early. He had his tent. He got up on his own. He went out for a walk. He studied. He was in every meeting. He listened to every message. It, it was a powerful encouragement to us. So every one of us have no excuse in this room to not do what God is calling us to do. If we cooperate with God, he will do the impossible. Our responsibility is to follow him as our leader, and his truth will triumph in our families and in our children. As we take a couple of moments as the piano plays quietly to reflect, let's just be open to what God would have us to do to be the parents that our children can more safely follow. Shall we kneel as we close? Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your word. We're thankful for you as our God, our Father, and our leader. We're thankful for your son who came to this world to, to show us, not just to tell us, but to show us the way as well by precept and example. And I pray, Lord, that as we um, go forward from this moment, that we as parents and grandparents will remember how important it is that we are committed to stay close to you and that we study your word and that we will be good examples for our young people and that we will encourage them to take Christ as their head, him as their leader, and to follow in his footsteps that the truth in our hearts and in their hearts will bring us everlasting triumph. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen.